hey, I think we should do this for starters. It's Steve's birthday. Would everybody say happy birthday, Steve? You've never looked so good, so fit? All right, 21 again. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a real privilege to be with you this morning and for us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us and to celebrate that the tomb was empty, that he is no longer there, that he is risen from the dead. Now, before we launch this morning, I want to share uh, just one thought with you. Next week, uh, how many of you know that in seven days we'll do this again? We'll be right back here, different times, but we'll be right here. And I want to invite you, especially uh, if, you, if this is a first time or one of your first times, I want to invite you next week. We're going to launch a three-part series. It's called One Minute After You Die. You know, if you're on the younger end of that, uh, most of us can remember feeling like that. that's for great-grandparents and that's forever away. If you're in midlife, it might still seem a bit away. And there's some of us in this room that, that we know that we're on the final chapters of the life that we've been given. Now, here's the thing. Scripture leans deep into this topic because God wants no one to have any fear or anxiety about what it means to move across the threshold from this present life, past death, into the life to come. And Jesus has so many hope-filled things, and you owe it. You owe it to yourself to make sure you know what he has said and how we can respond to that. So would you join us next week? One minute after you die, we'll launch that next Sunday. All right, well, here's what I want to do today for Easter Sunday I want to start by telling you the story of the man who wrote a hymn that we just sung called Amazing Grace. His name is John Newton. He was born in 1725 in London. And um, how, many of you, uh, how many of you, as a parent, you raised a hell raiser? Let me see those hands. Okay, good. Thank you for your honesty. How many of you, how many, truth be told, you were a bit of a handful. You were a bit of a hell raiser growing up. How many of you, you invited a hell raiser today? Let's just, all right. Well, John, growing up, was a bit of a mess. Uh, his mom died when he was age six. His dad was a sea captain, often gone at the sea. He was raised by an emotionally distant stepmother. And uh, as a young man, John entered into the same vocation of his father. He took to the seas, and I'll tell you what, he was quite a wreck. He was a raging alcoholic. He was rebellious. He was arrogant. He was vile. He was crude. In fact, how many of you have heard of the phrase, that person cusses like a sailor? That probably was named after John Newton. One of his captains wrote in a diary, not only does John use the worst language I've ever been exposed to, but, quote, he creates new words that exceed the limits of verbal debauchery. <laughs> Some of you middle schoolers know exactly what I'm talking about right now. John was so violent, he was often just hated by his crewmates. I mean, he just lived a very rough life. In fact, there was one time his crew left him in Africa, literally. Like, we're done with you, good luck. Find a way back home. 15 months he spent there. There was one time his captain was so angry at the rebellious spirit of John and how he would actually incite others to make up uh, lyrics in opposition to the captain that the captain stripped him buck naked in front of all 350 crewmates and he received eight dozen scourgings. The nickname that John had in those days, true story, the, his nickname was the Great Blasphemer. That word blasphemy means to mock God. And John had such a rebellious spirit towards the authority of God that they called him the Great Blasphemer. And even though his mom had tried to instill a living faith in John, she was white hot for God herself, and she taught John scriptures, she shared Bible stories, she even helped him memorize some stuff even in those early days. And even though she had tried to help John launch his life in the direction of a living faith in God, uh, John was adamantly against it, and he vehemently opposed God. And not only was he against God, he tried to bring as many others to that viewpoint as he lived out his life. Then came March 21st, 1748. John was aboard a ship called the Greyhound. He served in the slave industry. And at that time, a violent storm came upon the Atlantic, so violent that John had not seen anything like it in his day. Their ship was thrashed about for seven days, going wherever the winds took it. The sails were ripped apart. Siding was begin, beginning to come off the sideboards of the ship. Most of them thought they were going to die. In fact, there was one time when John was standing, and not, not too far away, a friend of his was completely washed off the deck and never seen again. And in a moment of desperation, John hanging to the steering wheel 
having a break to try to hold this thing somewhat in a rudder direction, John found himself, the man who had mocked God all the way up to this point, who was in opposition to God, who actually hated God, John found himself looking heavenward, thinking this was the final few moments of his life, and he uttered a three-word prayer to God, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In desperation, he called out, and that's actually the catalyst. That's the beginning point for a spiritual awakening in John's life. They were saved, and when he got back homeland, he began reading the Bible. He began studying the scriptures. He began opening his heart to the person and work and leadership of Jesus in his own life, and that began an, an amazing transformation. John Newton was transformed by the grace of God. Several years later, in 1772, he took pen to pad and he wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace. We have now been seeing it for 250 years. Whether you consider yourself a follower of Christ or not today, most of us recognize those lyrics and the tune to that song. So when you sing that song, and we're going to give you the second crack at it at the end of service, I want you to feel the weight of a man who was known as the great blasphemer, but who experienced the amazing grace of God. He wrote these words in the first and second verse. He wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Friends, the story of Easter, the historical account of Jesus giving his life for the sins of the world, yours and mine, and rising victoriously, conquering death in death. The story of Easter is the story of God's amazing grace towards us. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to keep it simple. I want to share one of the favorite passages of mine in the New Testament, and I want to share three thoughts that I believe summarize the hope to be found in Easter through this text. We find it in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the backdrop for it is there's a guy named Paul, and he is writing this letter, and he's going to share some things. Now, when Paul opens up chapter 2, he is super excited. How many of you have a friend, when they're amped up, they just begin to talk rapidly? They begin to go, maybe you're that person. Paul was that person. This is probably the worst run-on sentence in all of the Bible. I did a word count on it, and Paul, before he gets to a period, uses 218 words. It's like 65 commas and semicolons and hyphens, and he's just radiating with joy. He's overcome with this idea of what it means personally and what it means for everyone to encounter the grace of God in their lives, and he writes about it. So if you're taking notes, you can jot down, here's where we're going, the simple gospel. There's three things that Paul says. The first big theme that he introduces us to is he says this, he says, you were. If you're a follower of Christ today, we're going to learn that you're not what you were. And then Paul points out the second theme of, of but God. You were one thing, but God intervened in your life if you've allowed him to. And how did he do that? Well, God intervened, third idea is by grace. You were one thing, but you're no longer one thing if you're in Christ because God has intervened. And he hasn't done it with your help. He hasn't done it through your power. He hasn't done it through your religious keeping. No, he has done it sufficiently through his loving grace towards you. So, let's start with you were. Now, let me give you a little heads up. We're gonna work from negative to positive. Everybody say negative. That's where we're going, all right? Tell your neighbor, this one's gonna hurt your ego just a little bit this morning. Okay, Ephesians chapter two, verse one. Here's what Paul says. He says, as for you, here it is, you were, past tense, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In other words, if you're a follower of Christ, you're not what you once were. You have been transformed. You are now forgiven. You are now a new creation. God is doing something new and fresh and eternal in your life. But you were dead in your sins. As if that's not bad enough, he continues the theme in verse 3. He writes, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. That word flesh, it's the word sarks, and what it means is actually our sinful nature. It's that nature that we come onto the scene of 
human life with that's in opposition to God. Either passively, I just don't care much, or John Newton actively, rebelliously, uh, mockingly towards God. But Paul writes that you were gratifying the cravings of your sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now, if you invited a friend today, you might be saying, Paul, could you have opened up a little bit lighter? They finally said yes to the invitation. But what is Paul saying here? Paul's saying that, that there's a reason. There's a reason Easter not only includes an empty tomb, but it includes a broken Savior, bloodied and dying for you. It includes him saying, it is finished, that he actually accomplished something that needed accomplishing on your behalf and on my behalf. That's what gives Easter power is that Jesus made something possible that was not previously possible. That we were one thing and we couldn't figure out how to get out of that one thing. And that one thing left us stranded, alienated, separated from God. But yet God, persistent in his love towards us, provided a solution in the coming of his son who would take the wrath and the curse and even that judgment that's spoken about here on his own shoulders in our place, if we will allow him. Now, here's the thing. I, I know in our culture today, there's a lot of pushback on this. You might find yourself thinking, well, hang on, Bart. Time out. I'm not that bad of a person. I have, inherently, a good heart. You should see some of the friends and some of my neighbors. Now, they're messed up, but I'm doing okay. The Bible says that we were born with a sin nature. How many of you have had the joys of raising a young child before? We have a three-year-old right now named Galilee. She is the delight and the love of my life. But when she was two at, uh, to age two at some point, I can remember looking at Heather and say, hey, we have entered into a new stage. We are now negotiating with a known terrorist. <laughs> have you ever felt like that? Like you begin to see this budding nature that's in opposition, definitely to the holiness. If there is a standard of perfection, we know right in the beginning we missed the mark that there's something inherently within us that drives us in a different direction. Not God's direction, but in a different, self-absorbed, self-direction. We've inherited, the scriptures say, a sin nature. And that can be traced back all the way to the beginning, to Adam and Eve, and it's been passed on generation to generation. Your grandparents had it, your parents had it, and you're infected with it as well, and so am I. And we might want to be good, we might try to be good, but if you stack my life up against the holiness and the moral perfection of God, I'm toast. And I would suspect, so are you. The Bible says we are by nature's sinner, and we are by nature deserving of judgment. Now, let's just do this. I want you to play along with me, because you might be thinking, I think, Bart, that shoe fits you, but I might be the exemption in the room. Let's try it together. All right, here we go. Self-identification. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Raise them up and hold them up. Hold them up. All right, look around real quick. If you see someone with their hand down, liar, liar, pants on fire right now, you just call them out. Call them. We're in church. We shouldn't be lying in church, all right? Especially on Easter. You're dressed up. Don't lie. It looks bad on you, okay? All right, number two. How about, how, this is a little harder. How many of you, you've ever stolen something? Put them up. Yep, put, hold them up. Come on now. Confession is... Good for the soul, bad for the reputation. Let's see him. All right, for all those that have your hand down, listen, last year we went through like 20 million SFWC pens. <laughs> they have left the building. I'm just saying. All right, number three. The Bible says, in your anger do not sin. In other words, anger is part of the emotional uh, compository that God has given us. When we see injustice or when we're frustrated or when we see wrongs, we naturally get angry. But the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. How many of you can acknowledge you have blown right through the guardrail and you have done well at singing, sinning in your anger before? Okay, good, hands down. All right, last one, number four. Now listen, no raising your hands on this one. I don't want anybody's marriage getting messed up, Okay. You can give me like an eyebrow raise, quick, I'll see it. You can give me a nice soft pinky raise if you want, okay, I'll see it. How many of you have ever lusted before? You don't have to hold them up, yep, some of you are really brave. 
Jesus said, but I tell you the truth. Anyone who looks lustfully on another woman has committed adultery in his heart. In other words, there's an external action that could take place, but long before that, sin grows in the inner convictions of our heart. And Jesus knew that and noted that to us. Now, if you went four for four today, congratulations. You are a lying, thieving, (laughs) sinning adulterer. Look at your neighbor and say, happy Easter, you filthy animal. (laughs) All right, now why are we together going after this? Here's the point. You will never, until you see yourself as a sinner, you will never see your need for a savior. Until you see yourself as God sees us initially, as by nature sinners, you will never recognize that you personally and I personally have a need for a savior and his name is Jesus. Here's the thing, Jesus didn't bust into our world. He didn't leave the glory of heaven and encamp himself in our human flesh. He didn't come for partial sinners. He didn't come for semi-sinners. He didn't come for not so bad sinners. He actually came, here's what he said. Jesus defined his mission in coming like this. I haven't come for the righteous. I've come for those who self-diagnose that they're sick. I, I, I've come to, to seek and save those who acknowledge I'm lost. I'm in trouble with God. There's something inside of me that needs to be healed and restored and spiritually made alive before God. And there comes a point in everyone's life when they make a decision on this. And this decision impacts life today, life tomorrow, and life for all of eternity. There came a point in John Newton's life No matter how hard and how fast he had run from God, there came a point where he acknowledged his need for a savior. There came a point in my life, I was thinking about it this morning, sitting here all by myself while the worship team was practicing early this morning, and that song, Amazing Grace, came on. In the hour I first believed, they sung that lyric, and my mind took me three and a half miles down the road to when I was 15 years old, and I heard Pastor Bob Silver share the gospel, and all by myself, with no fanfare, I said yes to Jesus Christ, having no idea where that journey would lead me. Not even thinking it was that big of a decision, to be quite honest. And now, all the more, any time I think of that lyric, the hour I first believed, I know that was the trajectory changer of my life. And it continues to be the transforming factor of my life, experiencing the grace of God. So what does Paul say? Paul says, you were. Everybody say, you were. All right, better news. And then he says, but God. He says, you were, but God. I want you to think with me about the life of Paul. Who was Paul and what did Paul do? Well, before Paul's God moment in his life, did you know that Paul actually took the the lives of other Christians? All right, some of us, this might be a really new experience being in church and welcome. We are so deeply honored that you're with us. Seven days, we're gonna do it again. We wanna invite you back. But did you know that, that Paul, before he... He was a, a follower of Jesus Christ. He, he was a guy who, who was in opposition to everything Christian. He, he, he was the guy that, that hunted down followers of the way, those who named the name of Jesus, those who stood to say, I'm living for Jesus with my life. He hunted them down. He imprisoned them if he could. He stood by giving approval for their execution if he could. This is the guy that later on will write two-thirds of the New Testament. About 13 of the books come from God inspiring Paul to capture thoughts that we now have in the scriptures. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, I don't know. Paul's rejection of God and Paul's opposition to the people of God, that was a long time ago, and I just don't know if if it's that big of a deal. But I want you to think about Paul's life like this. Today, if a group of people go after a group of Christ followers, and they capture them, and they take them to some beach on a remote location, and they set up video equipment, and they ask them to renounce their faith right there in that moment or be executed. And for those that have the courage to say, I will not forsake Jesus, they chop their heads off. That happens today. And can I tell you, Paul would have been numbered among them for the life that he lived in opposition to the Jesus whom we are celebrating today. That was Paul. He traveled in fanatic opposition to all those who were following Christ. And Paul was involved in prisoning them separating families among them, and on occasion, seeing to their execution. The Bible says you were 
dead in your transgressions and sins. Now imagine, if you will, imagine sitting down with Paul and saying, Paul, could you tell me a little bit more of your story? What happened in your life? Paul would say something like, I was the guy that hated Christians. I was the guy that hated everything about them, that wanted to do all that I could to destroy their testimony, to decimate what they were determined to bring forward in the world. I was the guy that couldn't stand that they were proclaiming Jesus as some savior, as some Messiah. Couldn't stand that they were, they were passing around some hypothesis of a resurrection, the audacity of them to do it. And I'd gone to the high priest, and I said, give me papers to go to Damascus, and I will round up whoever I can that has allegiance to Jesus. And on my way to Damascus, a light suddenly, boom, came out of the sky. It knocked me to the ground. Suddenly, I could not see. I was blind. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I looked heavenward, though I couldn't see, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And that voice told me to go to the house of a man named Ananias. And so I was led by my co-workers to a man named Ananias, who should have hated me, should have despised me among all people for what I did to his people and what I did to his Savior. But instead, Ananias took me in. With fear and trembling, he laid hands on me, and he prayed for me. And in that moment of prayer, something like scales fall, fell from my eyes. And for the first time in three days, I could see I was blind, but now I could see. I was baptized right there. My whole life script was instantly transformed. He prayed and he prophesied over my life that I, who had spent recent time killing Christians, was going to be one now who would go out into the highways and byways, the towns and cities, and I would proclaim in Jesus the death and resurrection that allows for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life for the entire world. I was lost, but now I am found. Paul would say, I was the worst of the worst. I was an enemy of Jesus, but God, who is rich in mercy, Save me. Watch what he says in Ephesians 2, 4. Here it is. He says, but God, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul would say, I was against Jesus. I was spiritually dead. But let me tell you the second part of the truth. I was so deeply loved by God. That like you, I was so deeply pursued by God. And he loved us so much that he gave us life. And how did he do it and when did he do it? He did it through the resurrection and he did it when he raised Christ from the dead. This moment, roughly 2,000 years ago, was the moment, was the weekend that all of redemptive history had been pointing towards. We see it so clearly now from Genesis all the way through Malachi in the Old Testament, that Jesus is at the center of the proclamation and the coming promise of God. And in this moment, what was happening? In the very city where Jesus was marched outside of it with a crossbeam on his shoulders until he was too weak to carry it, and Simeon had to pick it up, and they marched into Golgotha, and there his wrists were pierced, and his feet were pierced, and he was erected up probably naked after having been scourged and brutally victimized And there Jesus hung. What was happening in the city that weekend? Well, friends, don't miss this. Because God had been preparing for this moment for all of human history. And in that moment, the Jews had gathered like they had every year for about 1,500 years without missing. And they had come to celebrate the Passover. You say, what's the Passover? Well, the Passover was instituted when they were slaves in Egypt. And God said, I'm going to do something awesome in your day. I'm going to bring about an incredible rescue, an incredible delivery. You're about to see my grace and my power bring you out. But here's what you need to do. You need to take a one-year-old lamb, and you need to sacrifice that lamb as a substitute in your place. And then you need to take the blood, and you need to put the blood on the door frames of your house and on the top of your door where you enter. And that night, I'm going to send an angel of judgment, an angel of death, But for everyone in whom the blood of that lamb is on the doorpost, judgment will pass over and you will receive mercy and you will be brought 
forward into the promised land. 1,500 years, they have celebrated the Passover. And now Jesus is exiting, and we move to the New Testament, and now the Lamb of God, that's what he's called. John the Baptist said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what they had been commemorating for 1,500 years as a temporary sacrifice, every year they made sacrifices, Every month they made sacrifices. Every week they made sacrifices, knowing that the sacrifice, they're taking the hit for my wrongdoing. But they always knew it was temporary. And now in Jesus, the once for all sacrifice was being made. The perfect son of God was giving his life for the whole world that would never need to be repeated again. Jesus, the lamb of God. Picture it with me. It's Friday. Jesus hangs there, bloody, broken, the creation mocking and rejecting the creator. And Jesus gasps out seven statements, three prayers. One of them he says at his worst moment, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. But God, but God who is rich in mercy, and who loved us so much, Paul writes about, that he willingly laid on the iniquity of his son the sins of all of us. Jesus, nearing that place of dying in our place, utters out to God, Aloy, Aloy, Lama, Sabakathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the most interesting and profound statements of Jesus on the cross. And it's almost as if the Son of God Hanging there in that very moment, the father looking away from the son for the first time, they've eternally enjoyed perfect fellowship with one another, forever past, and they will forever future. But in this moment, God allows the full weight of my sin to be directed on his son. God allows the full burden of your sin, your shame, your guilt, to be laid upon Jesus and to be settled eternally in Jesus. Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. The earth goes dark. The ground shakes. There's such supernatural phenomenon in that moment that the centurion on guard in charge looks up to Jesus and says, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus is taken down from the cross. He's placed into an empty tomb. His closest friends and followers are absolutely mortified. Jesus was their hope, and they didn't understand a death coming, even though it had been talked about by Jesus himself. They didn't know what that meant. They certainly weren't anticipating a resurrection They don't know what to do. Day one, Friday goes by. Day two, Saturday goes by. Day three, the women who love Jesus take off to his tomb. They're not going there to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. They're going there to put spices and to bury him properly. And as they approach it, they see two angelic beings who are looking on and who pose a question. And they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen from the dead. Paul later on writes, but God, but God, but God loved us so much that he forgave our sins and he's willing to change our lives. He's willing to affect all of our future and he did it when he raised Christ from the dead. You were, but God, and now the third movement by grace, by grace. Paul ends that long, run-on, enthusiastic sentence and and lands the plane by saying this. He says, for it is by grace, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by your works, so that no one can boast. Paul says, look, Jesus didn't need some of your help. Jesus didn't need some of your religious effort." Jesus didn't need some of what you could bring to the table. No, no, it wasn't what you brought to the table, it was what he brought to the table. And it's the gift of God. It's an an action or initiative towards us that God did all of the work required to purchase your freedom, 
to provide for your forgiveness and to welcome you into his family eternally. Years ago when I was in high school, I have a twin brother and Lakeside put on for the very first time a powerlifting contest. Anybody want to guess how big my brother was as a freshman in high school? 103 pounds. That's right, mighty men, orths we are. 103 pounds, and they were putting on a power weightlifting competition. Mr. Pettit was relatively a new teacher. He was jacked and pretty excited about it. So he entered, and Ben entered in this, and Ben had never done some of these lifts before. There was the deadlift. You all know what the deadlift is? The deadlift is where you take a straight bar, and you just have to lift it up and hinge to here. My brother didn't know what weight to pick, so Pettit's like, oh, you're pretty tough. Why don't you know 175 pounds? So my brother said, great. If that's what you think I can do, let's do it. They put 175 pounds on the bar. The gym is loaded with people, bench press, squat, and deadlift. This is the first event event Ben's doing. Packed with people. I'm one of those people. I'm not competing, but I'm watching my 103-pound brother. My brother goes up to the 175-pound deadlift bar, and let me show you what it looked like. (laughs) Took a step back, like, holy smokes. Mr. Pettit's like, I the tiger, you got this. <laughs> Steps back up, gets back down. <laughs> How many you know what the walk of shame is? <laughs> I felt so bad for my twin brother, age 14, 103 pounds. He just had to leave it there. He didn't move it an inch. Just gonna let you lie for the next guy, okay? I warmed it up. And he just had to walk out of that gymnasium into the locker room. Listen, we have a burden that we can't lift. If there's any other way for you to get right with God, he would have told you how to do it. If there's any other way for you to be forgiven, Jesus would have never come. If you could do it in your own strength, if you could do it in your own religiousness, if you could do it any other way than through the cross of Jesus Christ, he wouldn't have come. But it's a burden we can't pick up. It's a weight too heavy for us. I know we minimize our sin. I know we compare ourselves, and sometimes we feel like we're doing okay. But if you have to stack yourself, and if I have to stack myself to the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, to the perfect moral perfection of God, every one of us falls short of that standard. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is hammering at. You were, but God did something amazing in your life. And he did it completely by his loving grace. And he's inviting you and he's sweeping you up into this incredible life that will last now and that will last for all eternity. Let me close with a few stories. How does grace change our lives? How does the grace of God transform our lives? There was a time when Jesus was teaching in a public square, and in came a group of religious leaders trying to test Jesus, and they had brought to him a woman who was just recently caught in the act of adultery. And they look at Jesus, and they say, the Old Testament law says we should stone a woman. What do you have to say? And Jesus kneels down in the ground, and none of us know, but he begins writing something the scriptures say. I wonder if it was a list of anyone else's sins And he stands up and he looks those religious leaders in the eye and he says, if any of you you is without sin, then you go ahead and be the first one to cast a stone. The Bible says that one by one they drop their rocks. The woman, in fear and trembling, came before Jesus, not even probably able to look him in the eye, and he says, woman, where are they? Does anyone condemn you? And she said, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I. By grace, you haven't earned it, but by grace, go and live a life without sin. Go, walk in the freedom of God. Go enjoy the presence of God in your life. Jesus told a story one time about two brothers, and they had a dad, and one of the sons was like, I don't give a rip about my dad. In fact, what I really want from my dad is the inheritance. And so the father gave him his inheritance, and the son took off out of the town, running hard, running fast, running like some of us have with our lives, fast living. And pretty soon he found himself bankrupt financially and bankrupt spiritually. And he thought, I need to go back to my dad. I'm living worse than the servants at home. I'll just tell my dad, dad, would you take me back as a servant? 
And so he went back, rehearsed speech in mind, and a long way off, the Bible says, the father saw the son, and the father ran across the field, and he hugged the son, and he embraced the son, and he kissed the son on the neck, and he, and he told his servant, find a fattened calf, uh, throw a party, bring the robe, bring the signature ring, for this son of mine is lost, but by grace, he's been found. This son of mine was dead, but by grace, he's now alive. Even on the cross, as Jesus hung there, positioned beside him on his left and his right were two other criminals, and they were there for crimes they had committed. And one of them begins to hurl insults at Jesus. He says, hey, if you're, if you're the Messiah, then, 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 then save yourself and save us while you're at it. And the other one says, have you no regard for God? We're here because of what we've done, but this man is righteous. He is innocent. And the thief turns to Jesus on the cross, and he says, Jesus, will you remember me when you enter your kingdom? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, by grace, you will be with me in paradise. You were but God by grace. Let me end with this. How does a man like John Newton, who lives a corruptible life, who's called a great blasphemer, who takes immoral living to a new high, who loves sin and is unwilling to forsake it, how does a guy like John Newton become completely transformed? Did you know that John Newton went on to become a pastor for over four decades? Did you know that John Newton wrote hundreds of songs that have become hymnals, some of which we still sing 250 years later? Did you know that John uh, Newton had such great influence in his culture for Jesus' sake that he influenced some of the great missionaries? He influenced some of the great abolition, abolitionists that fought against slavery. He influenced some of the great thinkers and poets of his day. How does a guy like that become a guy like that? I love what Newton wrote in his early 80s. A few weeks before he died, he said this. He said, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Can I tell you this? Friends, grace changes everything. We might have been one way, but when God shows up and we have an honest moment where we invite God to perform all that he's accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we say, Lord, apply that to my life. Apply that to my account. I'm not bringing anything. I'm letting Jesus accomplish everything. And at that moment, grace can change everything. You might be here today and, and maybe you have done some things that are burdensome to you. You've betrayed someone that you love. You're not the parent that you wish you were. You've made decisions that bring a lot of regret today. Can I tell you that grace can change everything? One moment, one prayer, one savior, one God pouring out his grace upon your life. When you name the name of Jesus, friends, he hears your prayers. Just like John Newton, who was wayward in a bad way, God heard his cry for mercy. And God stretched down his loving arm to bring salvation and rescue into John Newton's life. If he did it in his life, if he did it in my life, I guarantee he will do it in your life. Some of you today, I think your hearts might be saying, I need the grace of God. I need the grace of God today in my life. Can I tell you, you're not here by accident. You're here by grace. You're here by God's grace to experience God's grace and to be made completely new. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Jesus, when in victory, you came out triumphantly out of the grave. Death had no hold on you. It never would, it never could. You're the creator of all things. You swallow up death with eternal life. You overcome death with life. You did it yourself as the first fruits and you promised it for all of us who hang on to you, who open up our lives by faith, who acknowledge who you are and what you've done and simply receive by faith that gift of forgiveness and salvation that's found in naming the name of Jesus. 
and believing in who he is and what he has done. Friends, if you're here this morning, if you're here this morning and that's your heart, you want to say, I'm opening my life to Jesus. I'm putting my trust in him and the sufficiency of all that he's done on my behalf. If that's you today and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, I'm just going to ask you, would you slip up your hand and just acknowledge with me today? Would you raise up that hand saying, today's the day where I'm grabbing a hold. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you for your courage. Anybody else this morning? Today's the day. On whatever ship I'm in in my life, I'm not letting the grace of God pass me by. I'm hanging on. I'm reaching out. I'm opening up a living faith. I'm trusting in Jesus. Father, I pray for anyone and everyone who uttered that in their heart. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for giving your life. Thank you for rising from the dead. And now we open up our lives to you. We receive you by faith. Lord, fill us with your presence. Direct us with your wisdom. Lead our lives. And I pray you show yourself strong and able and mighty, just like you did in John's life, just like you've done in my life. You have showed us who you are. And you've helped us to grow step by step in a very imperfect process. But you have helped us to know that this is a hope. This is an anchor. This is a refuge. This is a relationship with a Savior who will safely bring us to the other side. And Jesus, finally, I pray, as we celebrate your resurrection, as we go out of this place, would you help us to carry high and wide the love of Jesus to our friends, to our neighbors, to the John Newtons that we're around, to anyone who needs to discover the hope of Jesus, help us. Help us to love them with your love and to lift up this timeless message of the death and resurrection of Jesus that pours out life and hope for all eternity. So it's in the matchless name of the King of Kings who is risen today and we celebrate and give our worship in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.